My, oh, my. You know, I've been accused of stealing people's sermons. A man is to preach Sunday evening, and I'll preach Sunday morning, and he'll say, he stole my sermon. Well, I can do that now, because no one the sermon, uh, his Lord's Supper talk, stole uh, a big part of my sermon this morning, so... But I'm going to do what I tell those men to do. I'm just going to preach my lesson, and, um, and it'll be good. If it's uh, some repetitive, well, that's fine, too. we just uh, been singing and studying and praying and remembering. In fact, this morning, you made a choice to get up and get ready and come and, and dedicate your time. To worship the Lord in spirit and in truth as we sang a few moments ago. And we've done that because we have all been touched by Jesus. And when Jesus touches you, it, it changes your life. It changes your life for the better. And we have these wonderful stories um, in the Bible about the touch of Jesus. And I want us to be reminded of the change that Jesus made in us. But I want to motivate you as well through this story to talk to your friends about letting Jesus touch them and change their life. We've got these wonderful stories of Jesus healing people. And this morning, we're going to look at one of those particular stories about the healing of the bent woman. It's found in Luke chapter 13, verse, beginning verses 10 down through 17, if you want to begin turning over there. But I want to tell you, it is so important to understand what the touch of Jesus does, and what that means. You see, as we look through the ministry of Jesus, we see that Jesus touched people. And by touching people, he changed their lives. He changed their lives immediately. We are here because of that very thing. But we need others to let Jesus touch them, to let their lives be impacted by the Son of God, our wonderful Savior. Let's begin our reading in Luke chapter 13 and in verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she went and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all and when Jesus saw her he called her over and said to her woman you are freed from your sickness and he laid hands on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God now you'll notice in this story that Jesus finds himself in a very, very typical place on a very typical day, and that would be the Sabbath, and he finds himself in the synagogue, very common. He was a Jew, and that's where Jews go on the Sabbath day. But what happens there is something that sometimes did happen. That there was someone there in the synagogue that needed the touch of Jesus. They were physically deformed. They were physically diseased. And Jesus would heal them. Now you know as well as I do, when you put Sabbath, synagogue, and healing together, it doesn't go very well in those days. And that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 14. But the synagogue official, indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done. So come dur during them and get healed, 
and not on the Sabbath. Now, this is what a, a, a great verse here because it really explains to us why the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, and even a synagogue official had such problems with Jesus and the Sabbath. They believed that Jesus did things that were unlawful in the Sabbath, but what was it? Well, notice he said there are six days in which work should be done. And that really is a great verse that shows how they viewed the Sabbath and work. You see, in an effort to try to help people understand better how to obey the Sabbath and, and what was considered work versus what was not work, they came up with, at some point in time, that if it was something that you could do, that you usually would do on the six other days of the week, then you couldn't do it. On the Sabbath. And thus he says you can get healed on six other days. So don't do it on the Sabbath. He condemns Jesus. He, he, he warns the crowd. But then Jesus does something very reminiscent of what he did in Matthew 23. In Matthew 23, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. Jesus probably talks to the Pharisees and the scribes more directly and more truthfully than, than in any other context. Jesus says, hypocrites, you hypocrites. And one of the things you might remember Jesus saying there is he says, uh, he says to them that you love to tie heavy loads upon the people. You love to burden them down while you are not willing to lift so much as a finger to help lift that load. What in essence he is saying, what we would say in modern vernacular, you don't practice what you preach. You tell people to do this, but you don't do it. You tell people you can't do this, but you do it. Look at verse 15. The Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites. Notice the same language. You hypocrites. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. You see, a lot of the Jewish people understood that the Jewish leadership were hypocritical. But they are the Jewish leaders. What can you do? You can't do anything. You can't say anything. But Jesus comes and he does call it out. Jesus does bring truth to it. And they glorify. Finally, someone speaks the truth. I want you to notice what these Jewish leaders, this synagogue official was doing. When it came to the Sabbath, you couldn't lead your animal to water unless it was their animal. They would take their animal because he needed water. He, he was thirsty. And so they would take their animal and lead him to water and care and give that animal what he needs. But when it comes to a human being, when it comes to this woman who Jesus says is a daughter of Abraham. And when, when you say, when you mention Abraham and daughter or son and Abraham together uh, among a Jew, that carries so much weight. That was everything to them. You could lead your animal to water, but this woman bound by Satan cannot be healed because it's the Sabbath. They were putting their own animal and its well-being ahead of human life 
because they came to some arbitrary idea of what work is. Six days you can do it, don't do it on the Sabbath. And Jesus brilliantly shows the hypocrisy of that. We, we, we see that same kind of idea of people in their causes. Save the wells and save the rainforest. But abortion, no cause for that. No voice for that. No objection to that. That's kind of what we have here in modern time. But Jesus heals this woman. He touches this woman. And he changes her life. Now, what can we learn from that? Let's learn from the positive of this story, not just the negative, not just the hypocrisy, but let's learn from the positive. Well, what we learn from this is so important in the details. And that's why I want to get across to you. When you read the Bible, look at the details. Let the details speak to you. And pretty soon those details will, will open to you understanding, lessons, insights, and so here we have a woman and what? Well, one of the interesting things here is here's a woman bowing down to Jesus, but not as you might expect. She's bowing down to Jesus, not because of who Jesus is. She's bowing down to Jesus because she's bound by Satan. She's, she's bowing down to Jesus because she can't do anything else. This is her condition. One of the details that is so important is this detail of how long she's been in this condition. The longevity of condition is so important in these stories of healing. Here we have 18 years. Mr. Christ, can you imagine being bent over, hunched over, having to look at the ground, to look at people, you have to strain your eyes up for 18 years, day in, day out. Can you imagine what it was like trying to sleep at night? Can you imagine what it was like trying to cook food? When I think about this story, I, I think about my grandmother, my dad's mom, who spent almost her entire life up in the very cold reaches of northern Minnesota. She wasn't completely bent over like this, this woman here in this picture, but she was, as long as I knew her, in all my life, before she passed away, she was hunched over and she had this, this, this hunchback. Kind of like you think about the hunchback. That was her life. And I... I I don't know what was going on with that. I never really asked. I, I just felt kind of embarrassed to ask and talk about it. But that was her life as long as I knew her. She never complained about any type of pain associated with it. But that had to be a terrible condition. And here's a woman who has this for 18 years. We learn on occasion people that that Jesus healed how long they were sick. We had a woman that had a, a bleeding problem for 12 years. We had Jesus heal blind and lame people who were blind and lame their entire life from birth. And there's meaning in that. There, there's something that speaks to us. Hold your place here in Luke 13 and go over, if you would, to Matthew 19, verse 26. Jesus, with his own words, gives us the point that's being made. Why does God tell us how long these people have been sick? Look at verse 26. And looking to them, Jesus said, With people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Go back to Luke 13. All things are possible possible. In other words, when you look at stories like this, that Jesus is able to heal someone that's sick for 12 years, 16 years, 30 years, all of their life, the, the idea is there's no limit to his power, no limit to his authority. He can do it. He can heal anybody, no matter how long it's been, no matter what the condition is. Isn't that important to know? And that important to believe? I've talked with people, especially people who have 
come back from war. I, I've talked to Vietnam veterans that have come back and that war changed their life. We talk about Jesus touching us and changing our lives. That war changed their lives, but in a very different way. Not in a good way. And a common thread came out of a lot of those conversations where they're like, I did things over there. There's no way that God will ever forgive me. I did things for so long, so wrong, there's no way God will forgive me. Somehow they're the exception to what we see, but they're not. That's what these, these miracles of healing, that's what these stories of Jesus' touch are all about. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've done it. God can forgive you. God can heal you. Jesus can touch you and change your life. You've got to believe that. It's not on you, it's on Him. It's not on what, a, what you were able to do against God. It was, it's, able, what, it's His ability to what He can do for you despite that. That's an important detail in this story. I think there's another important detail, and that is that this is not only a, a miracle of healing, but is directly connected with Satan. Uh, twice in this story, let's go back to Luke 13 and look at verse 11, where we find out that this woman not only is sick, bent double, can't even straighten up at all, but her sickness is caused by a spirit, a demon. In verse 16, Jesus brings out that she has been bound by Satan for 18 long days. Years. You see, these stories of Jesus healing people, they definitely are stories where you learn about the ability, the power, the authority of Jesus. But there's much more to it. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, the enemy is Satan. The curse is sin. It affects everything. A life lived in sin is a life of death and destruction. We know that. That's why we let Jesus touch us. But there's people who don't understand that. How do we get them to see it? How do we get them to see what living a life of sin is all about? That's a, a life of bondage. It's a life of slavery, just as Noah talked about. We are slaves to sin. Look at John chapter 8, verse 34. John 8, and in verse 34, Jesus simply says it this way, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Look at the way Peter did it to Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8 chapter 20 or, or, or Acts 8 verse 23, where right after baptism he tries to do something that is not righteous. He tries to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit with money, thinking of it as just a, another magic trick. And Peter says to him, You need to repent. And among those words, look at what he says to Simon verse 23. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. And in the bondage of iniquity. How do we get people to see that? Because that's the problem with sin. It's deceptive. People think they don't have a problem. People think that they're free. They're not in bondage. They're not a They're free. They get to feel what they want to feel. They get to do what they want to do. That's what sin does. But that's why God gave us these stories of healings. These stories where Jesus touches and changes people's lives. Because what people need to understand is this is what you look like in the eyes of God. When you live a life of sin, this is what you look You're bent over. You're blind. You're lame. But people don't see it that way. People have to open up their hearts. That's the meaning of these stories. He's trying to give us a visual of what a life spent in sin really looks like. 
So the next time you see someone bent over, think about being a slave, being in bondage to iniquity. This is a story of a woman that's not only sick, a terrible sickness. It's a story in the details about a woman bound by Satan. This is what it looks like. And I want to tell you this. It really reminds us that, that Satan, he's not our best friend. He does not have our best intentions at heart. I mean, Satan, what does he do? Here's a demon, and, and it's, 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 it's kind of incredible. I don't know why I've ever thought this, but, but I always thought of demons possessing someone for a little while, causing havoc, and then leaving. I don't know why I think that, but here's a, here's a story that, here's a demon, and what does he do? He chooses to make this woman bent over. He stays in her for 18 years, and it would have been longer if it had not been for Jesus. And what is interesting, he heals this woman, and the story is reflecting more upon it as being a healing than a casting out of a demon. But both are involved. When Satan has an opportunity, this is what he does to people. This is the same Satan that asks permission to take Peter the apostle and sift him like wheat. This is the same Satan that did all those terrible things to Job to where he was not recognizable physically to his friends. Now, sure, he took Jesus out to the wilderness and he made him all these wonderful promises. And that's what he does. He says, if you will worship me, if you will be my servant, my slave, I will do these wonderful things for you. Don't buy into it. This is what he wants to do to you. It's stories like this that show us the true nature of Satan. And what he will do when he has the power and ability to do it. Don't give him that power. Don't give him that power over you. So what do we see? Jesus sees this woman, verse 12. And immediately, she's not the only one in the synagogue, but immediately his eyes go on her because he's a God of compassion. He's a God who, who can't stand to see people suffer, whether it's sickness or sin or both like this woman. And so what does he do? Verse 12, he sees her and he calls her over. And that's the story of us. Jesus has seen us in our weakness and in our sin, and he has called us to him. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The, the preaching of the gospel for the first time since the ascension of Jesus to heaven. And, 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 and so they're convinced both of Jesus and their sin. And they ask Peter, what shall we do? How do we fix this problem of this sin that we've committed? And Peter said to them, verse 38, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Look at this. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. He's calling us to himself that we can be healed. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. As Paul writes this by inspiration, Romans 8 and in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. There are so many passages we could look at that talk about God calling us, Jesus calling us. So he calls this woman, but that's only part of the story, right? This woman had to watch. She had to accept. She had to go to Jesus. There's two parts to his healing. There's the part that we have to do. Yes, he calls us, but we have to call out to him. We have to accept his calling. Look, if you would, 
at Romans chapter 10 now. What is Romans chapter 10 all about? It's about those who call on the name of the Lord. Look at verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our calling is our acceptance of that calling. It's us like this woman who goes to Jesus. We can come to him. That's our part. To open ourselves up. To let us be honest with ourselves. What does it look like when we live in sin? We come with humble hearts. Exalting Jesus. We ask for forgiveness. We tell him we're going to turn from that sin. That's what we can do. And that's what God expects us to do. That's all part of that calling on the name of the Lord. But then Jesus does what we can't. That's what he's called us to him. Because there's some things we can't do. And to release ourselves from the bondage of a nick, we can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. And so Jesus touches her. Verse 13, he laid his hands upon her. And immediately, she is made erect. She can stand. For 18 years, she hasn't been able to do that. And what happens is her life is immediately changed. You see, brothers and sisters Christ, we understand this. We're here today because Jesus touches us. Not physically, but through his word, through his love. And Jesus is calling people to himself that he can touch them, touch their lives. The same as he did back then is the same as he does today. Let's go over to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse... 21. Peter there writes, For you have been called. There's that calling again. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he did not utter, uh, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. That's kind of the ironic twist of the Bible. Through his suffering through his wounds we are healed through his death we are made alive that's what the touch of jesus has done for us that's the most important thing in life that's what everybody has to get straight before that day where we stand before the great judge who is jesus christ himself and so going back to Luke chapter 3, verse 13. Looking at the details. Where there is bondage, there is Jesus. Where there is sin, there is Jesus to touch and to heal. And if there is bondage in the bondage of Satan, then what? There's going to be freedom. And that's what, uh, that's what happens. In verse 12, he says, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. That's what we want to be freed from. We want to be freed from our sickness. And it's not cancer. And it's not arthritis. And it's not any of the number of things that people are plagued with. It is sin. That's what the story is all about. If he can heal a woman who's been sick by a demon for 18 years, then he can heal us. No matter how long we've lived in sin, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. You see, when Jesus touched her, she was freed and freed 
immediately. There was no pause. There was no waiting date. There was no like when you get new insurance and you can't use it for a year because there's a waiting period. That's not the way it is with Jesus. And we're here today because Jesus has touched us and set us free. Let's go over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. Jesus in his hometown, Nazareth, again in a synagogue on the Sabbath, takes Isaiah 61 and begins reading. And part of what he reads is this passage from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. With Jesus comes not bondage, but freedom. Look at John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, and in verse 32. Jesus simply says, You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And in verse 36, he says, So if the Son of Man makes you free, you will be free indeed. And finally, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the same passage that Noah used in the Lord's Supper talk. Let's look at it again. Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Let me, let me picture that for you where he says, don't go back to slavery. Don't go back to that. Jesus has given you freedom. Imagine this woman who's been bent over for 18 years. By a demon, Jesus comes, he casts the demon out, he heals this woman. She, she, for a week, walks about like never before, and then decides, no, I'd rather have the demon. I'd rather go bent over for the rest of my life. You say, that's ridiculous. Of course it is. But that's exactly what people do. They go back to sin. They go back to bondage. They go back to slavery. Why? Because they're blind by sin. And that's what it does. But that's why we focus our eyes on Jesus. Because he gives us a clear view of what sin does. He gives us the clear freedom because in Jesus, that's the only place you can truly be free. Jesus touched people and he changed their lives. How about you? Each and every one of us knows someone that hasn't been touched by Jesus yet. Let them see what sin really looks like. Let them know how Jesus can change their life with his simple touch. This woman glorified God. The crowd glorified God. And that's why we're here. We're glorifying God because of that healing touch. If there is someone here this morning that needs to be touched by Jesus, changed by Jesus, let us help you do that as together we stand and as we sing.